Sulek Dreyfus, lecturer in computing and information systems at the University of Melbourne. Sulek, good morning. Are you surprised by the sheer scale of what occurred yesterday? Uh, not a good morning for many people, I'm afraid. Uh, yeah, I, I was. I mean, it really is a, a bit of a wake up call to mm -hmm. the fact that we are pretty dependent on these types of security software that exists mostly in larger organizations, but most of us have never heard of these brands uh, because we're not really interacting with them. It's really the professional engineers who try and uh, stop cyber attacks on you know, networks that might have thousands of um, workstations in them. And they buy the security software to detect when the attacks happen and, and, and intervene. Yep, I'd be one of those. Last night, uh, I had no idea what CrowdStrike was, so it was a, a very much a, a research cram session. So when you say, what, what, how, how do we learn from this? What does that mean? Do, do these companies have to have maybe not just this system, but backup systems as well to almost act like a generator if, if, if the first system were to go down, the second one kicks in? Well, it's very hard, and the reason is because... Uh, there's obviously pressure in these sorts of companies from, you know, management uh, to the engineers to release that next fix or update or whatever. Sometimes you can make an error. And clearly, we've got an error happening here. Um, and then that can cause a catastrophic effect. It does show how dependent we are. But it also shows that these security uh, software, is, you know, expert software, if you will, um, has a lot of control over the system. So typically, these sorts of, even if you think about an antiviral uh, program you might run on your home computers, they tend to have high, very high privileges on the computer, meaning that they have sort of master control over the computer. Because if they didn't, if there was a virus on it then or malware, it could find a way to route around um, the software. But the problem with that is then when you when you have a problem, like you have you know a fault that's been uploaded, it can be very hard to actually undo it. And that's particularly so if you've been really good on security. So a lot of the CISOs the chief information security officers might have set up, done the extra due diligence of setting up um, encrypted hard drives, for example, for the hundreds of workplace machines that they have. And now what's going to happen is potentially they may have to go and actually type in or provide the encryption keys for each of those individual devices rather than a normal update where you just push that to, you know, 100 or 1,000 devices all at one time. So there's going to be a lot of cleanup time in this for some people. Yeah, it certainly sounds that way, Sulet. What happens now, and I know we're still in that period where the dust mm. is settling, but surely the, the question has to be, can this ever happen again? I think, unfortunately, it can. Um, so it shows us, in a sense, how dependent we are on these change, you know, to these supply chains of services, such as providing extra security notifications on networks, and that everything is interconnected. So, of course, it wasn't just saying, oh, you know, someone you're running an obscure bit of security software where it's all of the scary software that, you know, happens to be running on Windows, um, you know, happens to be running on Microsoft systems. And so, you know, that that then hits all sorts of things. I mean, people couldn't get um, food out of vending machines because it was interfering in the point of sale interactions there. You couldn't buy stuff, you know, at the counter at Woolworths or 7-Eleven was shut down because you couldn't process things. So there are lots of ways that our everyday lives are dependent on these systems well beyond just the workplace, you know, computer that you've got on your desk or the one that you're running at home. So, Len, how much, um, how much could this influence bad actors, you know, hackers <laughs> looking at the, the absolute carnage that an accident has caused, you know, are they scratching their chin here going, well, 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 uh, we, could, <laughs> we could do something and get behind this software update, which was described to us as kind of like a security guard earlier. I thought that was a good way of putting it. Yes. And then cause yes. massive problems. Yes, I mean, the, uh, those who research these sorts of vulnerabilities are often looking for exactly this sort of potential impact. Um, you know, it's like, well, how could we uh, disrupt, you know, if, if you're a bad actor, you're potentially working for a particular state, maybe attacking another state, trying to create, um, 
you know, lack of stability, you would be looking for these sorts of attacks. I mean, they're very cheap. You don't have to send a missile over a border. Yeah. Um, it can be done anonymously. Uh, and the answer is it's just given a really good indication and, and this wasn't even an attack of how easily our systems can be brought down if we're not yep. careful. That's true. All right, Sulet, uh, good to have you with us this morning. Thank you.